All right, thank you, brother. Now, just keep your finger there in Hosea 13. Can you please turn to Luke chapter 11? Turn to Luke chapter 11. Keep your finger there in Hosea 13. I'm not starting the sermon just yet, but I just wanted to show you something here in Luke 11 verse 50. Luke 11 verse 50, because I got a, a gentle rebuke on my sermon last week. So I won't name who it was, but, uh, you know, let me just correct something that I, that I said last week. So I was going through, you know, uh, the ministry of the prophets last week in Hosea chapter 12. And the man who's laughing is the one that, you know, gently rebuked me. You know, he did it the right way, don't worry. <laughs> now, nah, look, there's something I just need to correct there. But look at Luke, uh, Luke 11 verse 50. It says that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Okay, so this is the Lord uh, preaching against the generation he was, you know, preaching to because they were rejecting him. And by rejecting him, they were also rejecting all the prophets that came before him, right? And so you can see that the blood of the prophets are going to be uh, uh, required. Well, it says here in verse number 51, it says, From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily yes, I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. And so because this generation rejected the Lord Jesus, they also rejected the prophets that came before him. And you can see there that uh, Abel is listed as one of the prophets that, of the blood that was being shed there. So that, there's a correction there that uh, Abel is the first one at least that's given that title of a prophet. And I, what did I say? Enoch. All right. So anyway, the point was that what Enoch was preaching, uh, you know, being a template of, of what, you know, prophets ought to be preaching. But anyway, th appreciate that, brother. But if you actually don't move away from Luke completely, because may maybe turn to Luke 14, turn to Luke 14 for me. And then uh, go back to Hosea 13, Hosea 13. And look at verse number two, Hosea chapter 13 and verse number two. It begins by saying, and now they sin more and more. The title for the sermon tonight is, They Sin More and More. Now, I'm not going to preach as loudly as I normally do. I'm going to try to reserve my voice. You can probably tell I'm already struggling to preach a little bit. So if uh, Brother Matt needs to, I don't know, I don't know if you can lift up my, the volume of my voice, that'll be, that'll be great. Um, otherwise, just be patient with me. Um, I've been sick just the past week and I... I'm okay physically, but I've just, I've lost my voice. I lost my voice, especially on Sunday, I couldn't preach. I had someone to come and step in, preach for me. And then even Monday and even Tuesday, I was struggling with my voice. And this is actually the strongest I've had for a long time. Uh, so if you just keep me in prayer while I'm preaching, that'd be great. I need to keep my voice strong for tomorrow as well, Thursday. I, on Friday, I had a men's Bible study that I was going to do in the evening uh, with the men up there. I've canceled it because on Saturday there's a baby shower and I'm going to preach a little sermon at the baby shower and then I'm preaching on Sunday again. So I've got to just pray for me this week. I, I really need your prayers, okay? But uh, the title for the sermon, as I said, is They Sin More and More. And so what I was looking as I was studying for this chapter, I just couldn't help but see the parallels of the damage that sin has caused Israel and then to take that and apply that to ourselves or even to our state before salvation and just what sin does to ourselves. So we're looking at the topic of sin as we study through this chapter. <coughs> but Hosea 13, chapter 13, verse number 1, it says, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. So first thing you notice there is that Ephraim, of course, uh, been referred to as uh, Israel there, there was a time when Israel was a humble nation before the Lord. Because it says when Ephraim spake trembling, it's kind of like, you know, as they would sort of do the things of the Lord, as they would speak of the Lord and, and follow the Lord, they would do it by trembling. You know, and that's the, the fear of God was upon them. And when you have that fear of God, and when you can lower yourself and be humble, you know, you will be exalted. You know, this nation was exalted himself in Israel. It's not that he exalted himself in sin at this point in time, but it's that the Lord had exalted him. Now, I told you to go to Luke 14. So if you can go back there to Luke 14, verse 11. <coughs> this ties in with, of course, uh, the words of Jesus Christ in Luke 14, verse 11, which says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, brethren, I want to be exalted. Like, you know, I, I want to live this earth, like leave this earth and like, like leave a mark on this earth. You know, that there's something that I was able to accomplish, you know, whether it's the 11 kids that I have so far and what they're able to accomplish, that'll be great. You know, whether it's the two churches that I'm pastoring at the moment, you know, I want to be able to, to leave a mark on this earth, something that will continue on even after I'm gone. And I realize that I'm going to need to be exalted. Now, you can do, you know, do it in two ways. You either exalt yourself or you just humble yourself before the Lord. You know, just tremble before the Lord. 
you know, I, I've always told you guys, before I come up to preach, I'm always trembling. I've always got a fear. I've always got butterflies in my stomach before I get up here. And I need, I need the strength of the Lord, you know, to help me preach His Word. And you can see here that if you just obey yourself, if you just lower yourself, you be humble, it's the Lord that will exalt you. You know, if you want to be successful in this life as a Christian, leave a mark, you know, for, for the future generations and the work of God, you need to learn to just be a humble person. Hey, that's how Ephraim started, all right? Now, if you look at Hosea chapter 13, verse 1, the second part of it says, But when he offended, that's when he offended God, when he committed sin, in Baal, that's Baal, the false gods, he died. Don't forget that, you know, the people of Israel had gone and worshipped the false gods. And the Bible tells us when they started to do that, when they started to worship Baal, he died. The nation died. Now, you know, the, the first point that I have for you, brethren, is that sin brings forth spiritual death. You know, sin brings forth spiritual death. Because as soon as I read verse number one and he died, you know, I, I was immediately brought to remembrance um, Romans chapter 7. I'll just read it to you. Romans 7 verse 9, which says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay? So as soon as you have sinned against the Lord and you have that conscious awareness that you have done so, that you have broken His commandments, you die spiritually. You, you die that spiritual death. And it says in verse number 10, And the commandment, <coughs> which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, it slew me. And so, before you were saved, there was a point in your, in your life, okay, where you were dead spiritually. You know, most people in this earth, you know, they're walking physically, they're alive physically, but most people are spiritually dead, right? They, they've sinned against the Lord, just about everybody. I mean, it's, it's very few that would, would try to tell you that they've never sinned. Most people are willing to admit they've told a lie. Most people are willing to admit they've done wrong to some extent, right? They don't necessarily know the full judgment of God, but there's a, there's a concern, and, and they know they're not perfect. And so that's why, you know, you often ask the question, would you be 100% sure, you know, if you were to die, you'd be in heaven? Most people say, well, I wouldn't be sure. I have some doubts, okay? Because we all, you know, we all realize that spiritually within us, there is this death, that there is something lacking in us, right? And that's what takes place when you commit sin, you know, you, you die spiritually. And, uh, you know, if you, if you go back to Hosea 13, verse number 2, <coughs> And, you know, we're, we're looking at a nation that died, though. You know, and, and, you know, I often think about Australia. You know, is our nation dead spiritually? I'd say, yeah, man. There's just, I mean, there's a few signs of life. There's one at New Life Baptist Church. There's another sign of life at Blessed Old Baptist Church. There's some, there's some pulse there. But really, I mean, you know, this nation, you know, it's, it's dying. You know, this nation is dying. This nation has rejected the Lord. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, verse 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, our nation is a very sinful nation. It's a very wicked nation. You know, it's a nation that has exalted itself in the flesh, in our prosperity, you know, in, in the beauty of our nation. You know, the, the, the riches that we have here, it's exalted itself, but that's not, that's not what exalts a nation. It's righteousness that exalts a nation, right? Righteousness, being humble before the Lord, following after the Lord. If our nation was doing that, the Lord would exalt this nation. He, he wouldn't need to try to exalt itself. And in fact, when it tries to do that, that's when it dies spiritually because it's, it's far from the Lord. Now look at verse number two there. It says, and now they sin more and more. Now this is the reality, you know, that you know, in, in our lives, you're going to sin more and more. You've probably sinned already today. You're going to sin tomorrow. You're going to sin next month. You're going to sin next year. You know, you're going to sin to the, to the day you die or, or, or till the day that Jesus Christ comes back, you know, to, to take you away. And so once we have experienced this spiritual death this, that, that sin has brought, we, we, we are operating, you know, through this sort of this sinful flesh that we have. And as much as you try to stop sinning, you're not going to succeed. You know, a, a lot of religion, a, a, a lot of even Christians will tell you that salvation is by turning from your sins, by repenting of your sins, you know, self-reformation, right? And they're like, well, just, just try to stop sinning. Just be willing to try to stop sinning. Look, it's not going to work. Once you have that sinful nature, you're going to sin more and more. Salvation isn't how little can I sin. Once you've sinned, you've already broken God's laws. You've already died spiritually. 
right? Our, our nation is already dead spiritually as a nation. And so this is just a, a reality that we have to accept. And, and, you know, it can be embarrassing <clears throat> before the Lord when we know we've sinned against the Lord. And we'll look at that soon. But the reality is that you will sin more and more. Now, you know, as a Christian, we ought to desire to actually sin less and less. You're never going to get to the point where you no longer sin, okay? You're never going to get to that point. But for some of you that maybe got saved later in life, you know, you know what kind of life you got you were into. You know what kind of wicked things you got into. You know what kind of wicked imaginations were through your mind, okay? And you, you might have tried to live a good life, you know, in comparison to your fellow Australian. But really, you know, once you are saved, your desire ought to be, okay, it doesn't happen automatically, we'll have a look at that, but your desire ought to be, I, I want to sin less and less. Right. Now, I, I can't really say that because I got saved at four years old, right? I, I don't remember how wicked and terrible my life was when I was three. <laughs> you know, I, I've sinned more since I've been saved than before I got saved. You know, I got into worse sins after I got saved than before I was saved. And that's just the nature of being saved at an earlier age, okay? But one of the advantages of being saved at an early age, you've got the Holy Ghost in you early on, you know, teaching you, guiding you, teaching you the Bible, you know, and, and you, you don't necessarily, you know, you, you, you can make the same mistakes, but you have this inner being, the Lord God within you, that's going to keep you, that's going to protect you, that's going to warn you when you are, have that, when you do have that desire to sin more and more. Now, in what way did they sin? It keeps going there. It says, and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. I mean, that, that's kind of like a ridiculous picture, right? They create these, these calves, these idols, and then those that go and worship him, they go and kiss those calves. Oh, this is my God. They kiss him. I mean, just, a, just picture that in your mind and how ridiculous that is. But you go to a Catholic church and guess what they're doing? They're kissing the same idols. Okay, it might not look like a calf, but it looks like a human being or whatever. They're, still, they're kissing the feet of, of, of wood, you know? And, and so this is, it just shows us the nature of man, that we could get so far from God, and not, not we, but the unsaved world can get so far from God where they just want to go and kiss an, a piece of wood, kiss an idol, you know, and, and, that, you know, and that's their, their sign of worship toward a false god. Now, the, uh, the next point that I have for you here, brethren, point number two is a sinner is a servant of sin. A sinner is a servant of sin. Can you please turn to Romans chapter 6 for me? Turn to Romans chapter 6. Again, keep your finger there in Hosea 13. But go to Romans 6. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from John chapter 8, verse 34, the words of Jesus. He says, it says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Okay, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So, two realities here. One, before you were saved, when you sinned, you were a servant. Is that a positive thing or a negative thing, do you think? You know, if, if you're a servant of sin, it demonstrates that, that sin has power over you. Okay, you're a servant. Now, we still sin to, to this day, okay, as, as Christians. And so, in a, in a sense, when you, when you sin, you know, you're doing it through the flesh. You know, you are acting as a servant of sin. But the reality of, of your spiritual life is you are no longer a servant of sin. In fact, you're commanded to be a servant of righteousness. And we'll have a look at that soon in, in Romans chapter 6. But I wanted to park on this a little bit, especially for the younger people in our church. Because, you know, I remember going to school. And who were the popular kids at school? You know, I mean, you guys get homeschooled now. But, you know, you probably know what I'm talking about anyway. At least, at least your parents know. Usually the popular, popular kids in school... We're like the wicked ones. We're like the rebellious ones, right? Like they were the ones that were bringing, you know, marijuana to school, all right? Or, or drinking alcohol during lunchtime or something, right? Or, or going out and fornicating or something like that. Like these were considered, you know, I'm, I'm just telling you my school, maybe yours were, like, were the same, right? I'm talking about primary school and high school, doesn't matter which, which grade. They, they were often seen as the cool kids, all right? I mean, the, the student that was academic and did well, he wasn't really popular in school. He'd probably be laughed at, okay? Or the student who had good character, who had good Christian character, he wasn't popular at school either, okay? And so, you know, you grow up as, as, a, as a child and then a teenager, and, you know, for the children that grow up in church, you're going to start to see this a little bit, and you're going to see people of your age group, you know, committing all kinds of crazy sins, and it seems like they're just having a wonderful time, 
you know, you're going to think, man, what a hero. You know, I, I, I kind of wish my parents weren't, weren't so strict. You know, I, I wish my parents let me, you know, do what, a bit of what they're doing. But look, there's, there's, there's no, they're not a hero. They're a servant of sin. Sin has power over that individual, okay? They're a servant, they're a slave, okay? They're no hero. And, you know, I often remember, you know, going to a, I was going to a Christian high school and we would have people come and, and give their testimonies. And I, I've, I've, I've told you guys this before. But the, 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 the person that the students loved the most was always the guy who was, you know, he was a gang member. You know, he, he, was, he was out dealing drugs before he got saved. You know, he was stealing cars. And maybe he was in some biker gang or something. And he had long hairs and he's got tattoos all over his body. And, you know, he's telling all about his wicked, sinful life. You know, and, and you know, ultimately he's going to explain how you know, he's repented from those things and he got saved or whatever it is, what some false gospel. And, you know, and then they talk about how, you know, you know now Christ is in their life and, and now they're a better person and now they're serving Christ and, you know, they're no longer in that lifestyle. And, you know, what made them so popular was not that they got saved. What made them so popular is, man, that guy, you know, used to be in jail. That guy used to take, you know, deal drugs and, and he was out there doing all kinds of wicked things. That's what made them popular. It wasn't the testimony of their salvation. But really, the, the guy that has the best testimony is the one that grew up in a Christian home. And I don't, we, don't have, we don't all have this testimony. Grew up in a Christian home. Like, like okay, you know, get me up on, on, a, on a stage full of, of kids, you know, teenage kids. All right, guys, I'll tell you about my wicked life. You know, when I was three years old, I probably disobeyed my parents a couple of times. When I was four years old, my mom gave me the gospel. I believed on Jesus Christ and I got saved. That's not popular. You know, as far as, you know, what young people think. Hey, but that's a great testimony. That's wonderful. Right? It's, it's a wonderful testimony. You know, I don't, I'm not ashamed of that. But you know, when I was a teenager, I kind of, I kind of wished, I wish I had a bad life. I wish I had this testimony when I was out, you know, taking drugs and sleeping around. And look at me now. I'm a, look, look at me. I'm a great Christian now. I, I thought that way, brethren, you know, because we make our, 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 you know, churches, and, you know, they're not even real churches, but they make these people, these wicked people with wicked lifestyles as the heroes. Okay, they're not the heroes. If anyone's going to be the hero of salvation, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? I mean... Even the Apostle Paul said, you know, he counted all the things he did in the past as dung. Okay, but these guys use all this history. That's their ticket. That's what gets them to be a speaker. That's what gets them paid to go and, 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 pre and, and do their ministry. Okay, the, but they're promoting the wrong things. You ought to be promoting Christ and our testimony in, in walking his ways rather than promoting our old sinful lifestyle. Okay? Now, you're in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 17. Romans six seventeen. But God be thanked that ye were, notice that's past tense, the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now again, became is past tense. So the unsafe person is a servant of sin, but now that you are saved, what are you? A servant of righteousness. Okay, now, are you still going to sin? Well, of course, because if we keep going, it says verse number 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Why is it that you still sin today after you got saved? There's an infirmity. There's a sickness in your flesh. It's that sin nature, okay? So Paul is addressing this to the church there in, Rome's, in, in Rome. It says, For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity. So he's saying, look, the same way that you've used your members, your body, to commit all kinds of sin, he says this, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. So you see, when you get saved, it's not that you've given up sin to get saved, because if you had to give up sin to get saved, then this would be a pointless command, right? No, you know, once you are saved, we need to, what? Yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. This is not automatic. You know, a yielding must take place. You know, sin will be this constant battle till the day you die and until you have this flesh, this, this flesh with its iniquity of sin, okay? You need to understand, I'm going to have a battle every day of my life. Do I become a servant of righteousness, which, which I am? You know, I'm called to live after that righteousness 
or do I yield to the temptations of this flesh? Do I yield to the infirmities that I have in this flesh? And you're just going to have this battle for the rest of your life. I'm sorry to say it, but you will have it for the rest of your life, okay? But once you understand this, this is, this is what helps you, you know, live the Christian life, even though you do have sin that you have within you. Now, go back to Hosea chapter 13, verse number 3. Hosea 13, verse number 3. So the first two points so far, sin brings forth spiritual death. And number two, a, ser- a sinner is a servant of sin. <coughs> verse number three, it says, Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. And so Israel has been compared to all these things, the early dew that passeth away. So your, your, the, the current trajectory is that they'll soon disappear. Okay, you've got that early mist. Once the sun comes, you know, it evaporates away. It's gone, right? The chaff of the, of the grain. Once, you know, you, you want the, the grain, you don't want the chaff, the wind will blow it away. You know, the smoke that comes out of the chimney, it'll eventually blow away. And God is telling Israel, you know, you will soon be blown away. You, you will soon cease to exist because of your sinful uh, nation. Okay, verse number four. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. So the third point that I have for you here is that sinners need the Savior. Okay? Sinners need the Savior. God's telling his nation, listen, you guys are just sinners. You're soon going to die. You're soon going to pass away. But I'm your Savior. Okay? I'm your Savior. I'm the one that delivered you from Egypt. I can deliver you again from the coming judgment. Right? Now, we know they didn't heed the prophets. They did not heed the words of God here. But you can see that God is putting himself out, okay? For there is no Savior beside me. And uh, thou shalt know no God but me. You know, I really appreciate Brother Callum preaching on Sunday, you know, against, you know, even though it's a small part, but against oneness, against modalism. Because that is another God. That is another Jesus, Right? God is telling us here, Thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. You see, salvation is only through the one true God. You've got another Jesus, you've got some other God, there is no salvation in that God. Okay? Now, what's wonderful about this is we see that God is saying, God is saying that there is no Savior beside Him. And if you can please turn to, uh, turn to Titus chapter 2 for me. Turn to Titus chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 2, verse 11. This is about the birth of Jesus Christ. And it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay? So the Savior, the Lord, is Christ. Okay? So what, what I love about verse number 4 there in Hosea 13, it only points us to Christ. You know, Christ is the Lord God of Israel, even in the Old Testament. He's not some lesser being, all right? He's not some other God, okay? He's the same God of the Old Testament, okay? Jesus Christ. I'll also read to you in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, which says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says these words, Of whom I am chief present tense of whom i am chief so jesus christ came to save sinners what did we read there in hosea it said for there is no savior beside me the words of god okay so i don't know how people lose this you know people that do not believe that jesus christ is god when god makes it so clear there is just but one savior it's jesus jesus is the savior okay now notice what about paul what paul said to timothy though he says, of whom I am chief. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. Now, I've heard, when in my, one of my old churches, I won't name it, but just a young guy get up to preach, not the pastor. And he was trying to, he was really wrestling with this. Because I, I came to understand that he believed to be saved, you had to turn from your sins. Repent of your sins. And so now you have the Apostle Paul writing to a pastor. And he's telling the pastor that I'm a chief of sinners. And he says, oh, well, Paul was talking about before he got saved. 
Like, what in the world? No, this is present tense, right? You know, and, and so Jesus Christ saved us, okay? Yes, he saved us from our sins. Positionally before God, we're saved. Positionally before God, we're righteous. But we're still going to be this sinful person, okay? It, it's just, you know, this is the battle, you know? And even a great man like Paul was able to say, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners, okay? So, and this is good. Because when you struggle with sin, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When you struggle with sin, you can get cast down. You know, it's easy to get cast down. I failed again, God. I, 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 God, I promised. I said I wasn't going to. I, I did it again, Lord. When you, when you get cast down like that, just remind yourself, well, Paul, even when he's instructed in a pastor of a church, was able to say of himself, I'm still a chief of sinners. I'm still sinning today. Okay? So this is just, and, and look, was God using him? Of course he was. Look at all the churches he was planting, all the pastors he was mentoring, right? God still used him, even though he was able to say that he was a chief of sinners. Where did I get you to turn? Titus chapter 2, verse number 13. <clears throat> it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Could it get any clearer than that? that the Savior is Jesus and that the great God is Jesus Christ. All right. And lastly, I'll just read to you from Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay? So salvation is not just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also the rejection of false gods. Okay? You know, if you're preaching to a Hindu person, I've not had many Hindus call upon them the Lord. But the few times that I did, I didn't realize this at the time. I hope they got saved, okay? But I got told later on, if you didn't tell them that they've got to reject their false gods, you know, they probably just added Jesus to the list of it. Because they believe in like a oneness or modalist God. They believe like there's one, there's one supreme being and that there's literally tens of thousands. I think they don't even know how many gods there might be. And so they may consider, Je look, I hope they got saved, uh, you know. I'm not saying they didn't, you know, but I wish I knew this because then I would have made it clearer in my gospel presentation that salvation is just, like it said there in Hosea, thou shalt know no God but me. That's what salvation is. You've got to reject the false gods. And even if you believed in a false Jesus, you know, if you, if you believed in a Jesus of the Catholic Church or you believed in a Jesus of the Mormon Church or you believed in a Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, you've got to reject that other Jesus. That's not Jesus, you know, and, and believe on the right Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the danger of things like modalism and oneness, because it's so similar. Like it's easy to reject, you know, Allah or something, like a God that's totally different. But it's harder when, when they make other gods, another Jesus, and it's so similar. And there is no salvation in that Jesus. Okay, this is why, you know, preaching against modalism and oneness is necessary. You know, as much as I kind of cringe to think about this thought, because I don't want to always, you know, consider my, my sin in church but you know it needs to be taught because otherwise we're leading people to have a false profession or, or salvation in a false god you know another jesus is a false god we need to make sure that we believe in the jesus in the god that delivered them out of egypt the god who is a savior you know who's god and, and the savior who's christ jesus christ the son of god now go back to hosea 13 please verse number five Hosea 13, verse number 5. Point number 3 was, sinners need the Savior. Verse number 5 says, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. So, you know, after they left Egypt, you know, they were wandering in the wilderness, and there were times they needed water. Well, God was there with them. God saw them through some hardships. Verse number 6, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled. So did God provide for the Israelites as they were going through the wilderness? Yeah, you know. And uh, God provided for them. But then it says, this, and they were filled. I, I, I like being filled by God. You know, before church, I was able to just, uh, I took some photos, I went to Golden Beach, just breathed in some sea, and I just thought, man, thank you, Lord, that I can travel up here, even though I'm, I'm down in Sydney, and I can just, uh, you know, I have two churches, Lord, and I've got family, and I can bring Isabel and Sebastian with me tonight, and, and I look after my family, just having some time with God, you know, alone. And I, I was just thinking about how blessed I am, how filled I am, you know. I, I'm really happy. Even though I feel like this world is upside down. Like it's, I've never seen it so upside down, right? 
But anyway, I don't want to constantly be thinking about how upside down this world is because I get depressed. But when I think about how God has filled my life, how God has blessed me, you know, it's, just, it's amazing, right? But there is a danger when it comes to thinking about, or, you know, about being filled because it says there, they were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, have they forgotten me? Therefore, have they forgotten me? So when you're overly blessed, you know, one thing that you need to be careful of is you can have the tendency to forget God. When, when everything's going well for you, when your bank account's full, every bill is paid, you know, all sicknesses are gone, you know, you're getting a pay rise at work and you get along with your friends and, and you know, you get along with your family and your extended family and you just don't have any personal enemies. When things are just going super well for you, you've got to be careful, okay? Now, it's good to stop and thank God. But what can happen? What does happen? And what's happened in my life in the past? And I've seen this happen in other Christians' life. You forget God. You think, oh, it's just too easy, right? And, you know, one, a good prayer to have, and I don't know if you all want to pray this, but I pray this prayer sometimes. I say to the Lord, Lord, can you always keep a part of my life unsettled? Just, you know, God, you've given me so much. You've given me so much. And I, I, don't, I don't want you to turn my life into hell, okay? Because I, I want to have a happy life. You know, I don't want to be constantly worried and stressed. But can you always have just one part of my life that's not sorted out? You know, whether it's a, it's a bill that I can't pay, just, just one bill that I can't pay. Whether it's, uh, you know, things are going well at church, whether it's just, I don't know, a church member that's kind of making my life a little bit hard. It, it, it's good to just have a, just a, a situation where you're, you know, you're, you're not fully satisfied and then you're, you're driven to run back to God. When, when things are a bit unsettled, you know, you, you're, you're driven to run back to God and, and not forget Him. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to have everything sorted in life. I, I don't want to have every part of my life sorted where I never have to worry about a single thing or be concerned about a single thing because I, I, I can see the heart of the Israelites. I, I, I know my flesh and I know we're made of the same things and I know that I can have this desire to walk away from the Lord. Not even intentionally. Just because things are going so well. It's just you kind of forget the need to go back to God. And so I think it's always good to, to pray to the Lord, you know, not, not Lord, give me no problems. Not Lord, you know, turn my life into hell. But Lord, just always have something in my life that will cause me to run to you so I never forget you. You know, so I never depart from you. Verse number seven. Therefore, I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved from her whelps. Her whelps is her, her children. So this bear, mother bear, has lost her children, right? And now she's, she's seeking revenge, right? She's looking for her children. This is how God described himself. And then it says, And I will rend the coal of the heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Why is God saying this about the nation of Israel? Again, because we just saw in verse number 6 that they had forgotten him. And so when they forget God, God gets angry. He's, he's a jealous God, okay? He deserves worship. These are his people. He's looked after them. They've forgotten God. And God says, you know what? I'm going to be like this lion. I'm going to like this bear that just comes and destroys you. And of course, he's carrying that out with the Assyrians that are on their way. And so the fourth point that I have about sin, brethren, is that sin is offensive to God. Sin is offensive to God. I know you know this already, but we need to be reminded because sometimes we can sin against our fellow man and forget that we've actually sinned against God. You know, every sin that you commit is a sin toward the Lord. Okay, because what is sin? Sin, the Bible tells us, is the transgression of the law. Whose law? The laws of God. All right, God says, this is how I want you to live. These are the commandments I want you to keep. This is how I want you to follow, you know, uh, walk in, you know. And then when you sin, you break those things that God has asked you to do. All right. And yeah, you may sin against your flesh. You may sin against your fellow man. All right. You may sin against someone in your family. But every sin is a sin toward God. Every sin is offensive to God. Keep this in mind. Because when you sin against, you know, sometimes my kids might, you know, have a fight amongst themselves. You know, we always tell them, hey, go and apologize and, and say sorry and forgive one another. And, and they do. That's great. You know, but they need to be reminded, well, now you need to go and say sorry to God. You've offended God. You've broken God's laws as well, okay? And so you've got to keep this in mind that every sin is a sin against the Lord. Can you please keep your Bibles there and go to uh, Psalm 51 for me? Psalm 51 verse 4. Psalm 51. 
Psalm 51 is a very famous uh, chapter or fa very famous psalm. Does anybody know why Psalm 51 is a famous psalm? Yeah, when, when King David repented after uh, taking uh, Bathsheba as his wife and, you know, killing her husband. And in Psalm 51 verse 4, David says these words, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So, obviously, David sinned against Bathsheba, and he sinned against himself, and he sinned against her husband, okay? He, he sinned against man, all right? It's not saying, he's not saying that I, I, didn't, I didn't sin against anybody else, God. He, of course, he sinned against man, okay? But he acknowledges, even when I've done this, I've also sinned against you, Lord, okay? I've sinned against you. Uh, against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Keep that in mind. I think that's going to help you from sin sometimes, you know, before you, when you're having that temptation and say, do I commit this sin? Remind yourself, oh man, if I do this, I'm actually offending God. Do I want to offend God? Right? I mean, I don't want God to be like this lion or this mother bear, you know, that, that comes down on me with this harsh judgment. Right? So just, just keep that in mind. Go back to Hosea chapter 13, verse 9. Hosea 13, verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king, where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judges of whom thou saidst, give me a king and princess. All right, so Lord, telling Israel, yeah, you've destroyed yourself. You know, so that's what sin does. Sin destroys your life. But God is saying, look, if you want help, I'm here. Who's going to help you? He's saying to Israel, who's going to help you in this time? The only one that can help you is God, right? He says, I will be thy king. You know, God is saying, you know, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm, you know, take me again as your king. Uh, you know what, what, what this should remind us of? I'll just read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 6. Because remember, uh, before the kings, you know, God had the judges that would rule over Israel pretty much. They would travel to different places and pass judgment. Uh, Samuel, you know, not just a prophet, but Samuel was one of, uh, what, probably, uh, the last judge, okay? Because Samuel wanted to make his sons into judges as well, but the people rejected his sons because they weren't walking godly, all right? So, uh, what did they, they demanded a king. that They wanted to be like the other nations, and they wanted, instead of having this the system of judges, they wanted a king to rule over, uh, over uh, Israel. And then in 1 Samuel 8, 6, it says, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so the fact that they had these earthly kings, these, these men, men who are sinners, just like them, okay, with, with, with infirmities in their flesh, uh, demonstrated not just that they wanted to be like the other nations, but demonstrated that they had rejected God, even in those early days with Samuel, okay? And of course, you know, God gave them King Saul. And of course, you know, God would use that. You know, God per permitted that and God would use that. And eventually, you know, Jesus Christ would be born for that, for the kingly line of David. And, uh, and you know, again, you know, who is the God that's saying these words? It's, it's Jesus Christ. He says, look, I will be thy king, okay? You know, God ought to be or have been the king because there's no other man that could help them during this time of, of, uh, of judgment. Look at verse 11. He says, I gave thee a king in mine anger. So when they, when, they, when they wanted King Saul, okay, God gave them that, but it was in his anger. God was angry about that because they were rejecting God. But then he says this, and took him away in my wrath. So he says, I was angry when I gave you a king, and this last king that you have before the Assyrians come, I'm going to remove his kingship as well. I'm angry as well. The whole thing was, was, was done out of anger, you know. And, uh, but again, you know, God, God allowed him to, to have this and this was just a sign that they had rejected God as their king. Verse number 12. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. So the place of the breaking forth of children, of course, is the travailing woman. As, as though this woman is giving birth. All right, And so this is... 
the, the sorrow that's been brought forth from sin is being uh, made like, you know, like equivalent to a woman giving birth. Okay? It, it's, it's hard, you know, it, it's uh, tough on the body. But the thing about verse number 12, it says there that it says the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. And remember how we said, like, uh, you know, if, if a sinner is someone that is a, a servant of sin, so it's quite that they're bound in sin. But then it says, his sin is hid. Okay? His sin is hid. And so point number five that I have for you to, uh, today, guys, is that sin cannot be hid from God. Okay? Sin cannot be hid from God. I know it says his sin is hid, but it's not, you know, it's not that you can't hide things from, from God. Okay? But they're trying to hide it from themselves. All right? And we've all sinned, we, you know, and I'm sure... We don't want our sins all to be known. You know, I'm sure you don't want me to just come in and just start naming all your sins. And I don't want to start naming all my sins before you, okay? Because it, it's, it's, it's shameful, right? And one of, the, one of the, you know, worst things that you can do as a Christian is that when you know you've sinned against God, it's just, I'm going to hide this from God. You cannot hide it from God. But for some reason, we think this. You know, we think we can hide this from God. You know, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I'll just read it to you. If you can please turn to 1 John chapter 1. Go to 1 John chapter 1. I'll read to you from Genesis 3 verse 8. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So you can see the natural reaction of man. Ah, oh, sin against God. I've got to hide. God's walking. God's around. God's presence is here. I've got to get out of here. You know, this is one reason why people drop out of church. Because they know God's presence is in his house. You know, and uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it's, it's hard. But I, I, I understand. I understand. Because I've been there. I'm sure you've been there. Where you've sinned and you're just like, I, I can't even tell God about this sin. I can't even approach God. How can I face God and tell him that I've done this? But He knows. <laughs> that's what's crazy about it. God already knows. You can't hide it from God. But we try to hide sin sometimes. You can see it's just a natural reaction from man. Okay? And, uh, you know, when you do sin, it, it can cause you to just flee from the presence of God. And you're just making things worse. You're just making things worse for yourself. You're in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so don't tell me you've not sinned. If, if you tell me I haven't sinned today, I haven't sinned yesterday, I'll just say you're a liar. You're, you're not deceiving me, you're not deceiving God, you're deceiving yourself. Okay? It's just that, that, that desire and it is, it is natural because we have that flesh, the iniquity of that flesh, that battle that we constantly have to try to seem righteous, to try to hide. But you know, the best thing to do is just get a hold of God and say, God, I'm sorry. You know, I'm trying to hide this from you, Lord, but I, I can't hide from you, Lord. <laughs> you know, uh, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? God's in heaven, God's in, God's in hell, God's on the earth. I mean, God is everywhere. He sees all things. You know, as I said, we had a great sermon from Brother Callum on Sunday, reminding us about the nature of God. And so... You can't, you can't hide from God, but sin, you know, it, it will cause you to try to do that. It will cause you to try to hide from the Lord, hide from His presence, be away from the Lord. The best thing to do is just, just go to God, just admit, Lord, I stuffed up again, okay? Please make me right with you. I want to be in fellowship with you again, Lord, and help me put this behind me. You know, help me to be a servant to righteousness and not this servant to sin. Now, we're going to skip verse number 14. Let's go to verse number 15. We'll come back to verse 14 later. Verse number 15. It says, Though he be fruitful amongst, among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come, upon, come up from the wilderness. You know, that reminded me of that Kenneth Copeland. You know, the COVID-19. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> COVID-19. How's it going? Come on, you've all seen it. COVID-19. Ah, I, I blow the wind of God, you know. <laughs> well, look, there is a wind here, okay. <laughs> there is, I guess he's read this part of the Bible, right? <laughs> it says, look, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness and his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall 
be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. And so verse number 15 said, it looks like you're fruitful, Israel. Looks like you're doing good, but God's going to send this strong wind. You're going to be left with nothing. Okay. Again, it's judgment that's coming through. The wind representing the Assyrians. Verse number 16, Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Now look at this. This, this. this is really sad. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. Pretty harsh, huh? Pretty harsh. The, last, the, the sixth point that I have, it's not the last one, the sixth point that I have for you on sin is sin has lasting consequences. Sin has lasting consequences. I'm sure these people did not want their infants to die during this time, during this judgment to come from God, right? I mean, the Syrians came, they were violent. I mean, these are violent days on the earth, okay? And so children will be destroyed. Mothers would be, even with pregnant mothers, would have their wombs opened up and ripped up. And look, again, you know, Australians are doing this every day, right? Abortions, 250 abortions every day, ripping out the child out of the mother's womb. It's, it's crazy. I mean, we read this and we think, how harsh. But then our nation does it to themselves. They're not even waiting for God's judgment. They just, oh, we'll just do it. And it's wonderful. It's crazy. This world is upside down. But the point I wanted to drive here, brethren, is, and especially as parents, we have to be careful about our sins. It can have lasting effects on our children. You know, God can judge you because of your sin, put you in a bad place, and it just has lasting effects, lasting consequences, you know, to the following generations. Be careful about the kind of sins that you get involved in because your kids are going to think, well, this is just good and fine. Dad did it. And they're going to find themselves into getting to worse sins in their life. Okay? You know, we ought to try to set a good example. And when I say that, I know I sin, and I, my kids know I sin, and my kids know when dad messes up, and they know I'm not perfect. And, you know, we need to also teach our children that, you know, as parents, we're not perfect. You know, we're striving to live a godly life. We're striving to raise you to love the Lord and to serve the Lord. But at some point in time, you need to put your spiritual eyes, not on your parents, which are just human beings, with the infirmity of the flesh, and set your eyes on the Lord God who will never fail you, who will never sin, you know, who will always give you the best direction in life, better than mum and dad. You know, hopefully we can help in that process, but eventually our kids need to learn to grow up and say, well, you know what, thank God for my parents, but you know what, I've got a better father, a heavenly father, who never gets things wrong, who's my saviour as well. And so, I'm just saying, you know, obviously... It would be horrible to have your infants dashed in pieces. It would be horrible to have your babies ripped out of your wife's womb like this as a judgment. But this is not, you know, God did not come and do this, all right? This is the consequence of the sin. Judgment fell upon them. The Assyrians came. This is what happened. It had a lasting effects on the future generations. Please be careful about the kinds of sins you get into, okay? You're forgiven from your sins, but there can be lasting consequences, okay, because of your sin. All right, let's go back to verse number 14. We'll end on this one. Verse number 14. It says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Now, when we read verse number 14, what does that remind you of? Does anyone does ring any bells to anybody? As soon as I read it, because... See, 1 Corinthians, you can turn there now, 1 Corinthians 15 is like my favourite chapter in the Bible. Uh, you know, I hesitate to say my favourite. I think it is my favourite. It's, it's definitely, if you said, give me top five chapters in the Bible, that would definitely be there, okay? And as soon as I read that, I, I kind of forgotten that it was in Hosea. And it's like, oh man, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, okay? And I thought this was a great place to, to end the sermon. So turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Because Paul, as he writes to the Corinthian church, takes this from Hosea and teaches on this topic in verse number 55. It says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? How did Hosea term it? O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. The Lord is basically saying, look, he's going to have victory over death. He's going to have victory over the grave. Okay? And when we think of this, we think of immediately the resurrection. Right? And, and maybe your first thought is on the resurrection of Christ, and that's a good, good place to start, because that's exactly how 1 Corinthians 15 starts, on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this resurrection is actually our resurrection that's being taught here, uh, all the way you know, back, to, uh, back in the days of Hosea. 
And, you know, it's crazy how some preachers say, well, you know, the Old Testament prophets have nothing to do about, like, they, they knew nothing about the resurrection. They knew nothing about the rapture. They knew exactly about the rapture because this is what ties in exactly with the verses. Have, look, drop back to verse number 55 in the same chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, sorry, 51, 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. What's that? That's the rapture. Guess who else knew about the rapture? Hosea knew about the rapture. Okay? It's the same teaching. And then it says in verse number 53, for this corruptible, that's your corruptible flesh, that's your flesh with the infirmity, must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So point number seven is the resurrection is victory over sin. Okay? Now again, positionally, we have victory over sin. It's through Jesus Christ. It's through His resurrection. Okay? Spiritually, yeah. Our soul is saved. We have a new birth, the new man. But again, we still have this flesh. Okay? But the final victory against sin is going to come at the rapture. It's going to come at the resurrection. When you get a brand new body, you know, a body that is immortal, a body that cannot be corrupted, meaning it's a body that will never sin. You won't even desire to sin in that body. You won't be like, oh man, I wish I could get back some old sins in my old life. You won't even, that won't even cross your mind. Okay? You will truly, your, your, not just your spirit, but your flesh will truly be a servant to righteousness rather than a servant of sin. And it's amazing how Hosea knew all about this already. You know, God already revealed this. He's, he's telling, you know, God's telling about this nation, how wicked, how sinful you are. Hey, I'm your savior. I can be your king. Right? And not only that, Listen, you, you, you get saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, you're going to be brought out of the graves. Your body's going to come back to life in a new, better body, right? That cannot ever die. That will never be corrupted. And that'll be the end of sin. You're never going to struggle with sin in your flesh. So I say that because I want to end on a good note, okay? We have this constant battle. Constant battle. Ah, the sin, the, you know, ah, sorry, the spirit versus the flesh. One day, the flesh and the spirit are going to be like, yeah, who man, that's sin. Why did you guys ever do that? Right? You're just going to have this like, man, you know, that was crazy. But it's going to be wonderful that we can have these bodies and we never have to be ashamed of God ever again. We can see him face to face. Okay? We're never going to, I'm never going to go to, one, after the resurrection, I'm never going to go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry I sinned again. It's over. It's done. You know, it's the end of sin in our lives. So, you know, we see there that in Hosea chapter 13, we have this great promise to come, the resurrection. Let's pray.